I'm going to talk today about how we've been looking at using viral loads and within host models and to use that to improve our understanding of COVID-19 dynamics and to improve surveillance. So before I start, I just want to say um, most of this work is going to be from the work on the left and that was co-led with Brian. So if Brian starts grimacing or anything, as I say something he did badly, then uh, you know um, who to ask questions to. Um, and then also to thanks to all these uh, collaborators at the Broad who helps with the uh, data collection and um, sharing and also colleagues at the Harvard Chan um, for their input as well. And then I'm going to have a very brief bit of time at the end to talk about kind of a more recent project and that's all going to be work that was jointly led with Lee Kennedy Schaefer who was a PhD student in our department and now is a assistant professor at Vassar College. Okay, so the motivation for this talk is this WHO kind of stance on test, test, test. So there's been a kind of epidemic of testing as well as an epidemic of infections over the past year. And that's kind of illustrated by these few charts here. So we can see that since the start of last year, we've had this huge increase in the amount of tests being done in many parts of the world, but also a dearth of tests in other parts. So many countries, you know, they've been limited in their testing capacity throughout. And just for a bit of context in terms of absolute numbers, the US has now done 370 million coronavirus tests to date, which is a huge amount of data. And, you know, the Broad alone has performed 13 million of those tests to date. So the point of kind of showing you this is just to motivate this idea that we're performing these biological tests. We're kind of looking for a biological quantity and generating it in huge amounts. And so there's a huge amount of information there that we should be making better use of. I mean, the reason I say making better use of it is because at the moment we're just kind of using tests as this kind of binary data point. So we just count the number of new cases over time, kind of throwing away all that biological information in the process of doing the test. And so I'm going to address this kind of theme by going through these four um, kind of sections. So first I'm going to do a really, really brief overview of what I mean when I say viral load and viral kinetics. And given this is the Broad Institute, this is probably going to see, be a fairly um, cursory overview but it's all I think we need to know for modeling the system. Then because this is a models and methods seminar, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we developed a hierarchical model to simulate viral load distributions over time and to describe viral kinetics. And then I'm gonna apply these ideas to these two um, kind of results sections. So firstly, looking at pooling to identify individual positive samples and also to estimate prevalence. And then if I have a bit of time at the end, I'm gonna really briefly talk about this kind of work I alluded to where we use CT value distributions to infer um, epidemic incidents. And if you take nothing else away from this seminar, um, this is the kind of theme that I think is most interesting about kind of looking at biological systems from an epi perspective, which is that during an epidemic, when we account for the within host process, that provides us a more nuanced understanding of population level biological data, right? So we have surveillance set data sets where we're kind of observing these biological quantities, but we often neglect to consider that those biological quantities are arising from something that's going on at a within host level. Okay, so onto this kind of brief, brief primer on viral kinetics. So all of the data that we get from um, these kind of huge amount of PCR tests are what we call CC values. And ultimately what we're trying to do is to estimate viral load in a host. So just asking how much virus is there in the host? Of course, we can't measure, we don't count the number of virions exactly. We kind of take things that are proxy measurements for the true viral load. So what we do is we go out and we swab somebody, maybe a nasopharyngeal swab or take a sputum or a saliva sample. And then we try and measure how much of our proxy kind of quantity is in that sample. And so to point out there's variation both in the process of doing the sampling and also where we take the sample from. And then kind of really briefly, the way that qPCR works for this is we are kind of looking to see how much viral RNA there was in that original sample we've taken. And so the way that we kind of do this is we have an initial quantity of viral RNA in our sample. We amplify it a number of times until the amount of RNA in our amplified set uh, breaches some limits of detection. So you can imagine if there was a higher amount of RNA to begin with, we need fewer amplification cycles to reach this limit. So all that just to say that when we talk about CT values, a low CT value is something that's proportional to high viral load. So that's just giving you an idea of like, what is this kind of, these what are these tests measuring in terms of bio biology? And so that means that when we run these tests, which are semi-quantitative, and I'll maybe get to that later, but we have something that's like a quantitative measurement of the within host viral load. And why is this important? Well, it's important because the viral load in a host is not static over the course of infection, you know, and infection is a dynamical within host process. So here I'm showing a schema um, kind of in the, in the realm of a classic compartmental epi model. 
So individuals kind of go through these four states with respect to the disease. They start susceptible, they become exposed to somebody who's infectious, that exposure turns into a full-blown infection, and at some time later they recover. And that's normally how in epidemiology we kind of um, classically model the kind of progress of disease at a population level. But in the background, there's all of this within host biology going on that we need to we need to think about. So this is the within host biology of viral loads. And viral loads basically change based because they're kind of growing exponentially in the host as they infect target cells and then decline exponentially as the infection get, gets cleared. So we can model this with a really simple set of straight lines where on the log scale, the viral population increases exponentially. It peaks at some time in the case of SARS-CoV-2 around the time you get sick, and then it starts declining exponentially, ideally because the host has cleared the infection, the immune system's kicking in, but it can also be due to the limitation of available cells to infect. And what this means for things like test sensitivity and understanding things like transmissibility is that there's different windows of time. So you can see that you know, early on and towards the end, that person's still technically infected, but the amount of viral material in there is too low to be detected by a given test. Whereas when they're at the kind of peak of their infection, the amount of viral material is so high that it's very unlikely that we'll miss it if we take any sort of sample. Hey, James. Hey. This is Brian. So Brian. this is funny that I have a question, but uh, given the introduction. So just thinking about the exponential dynamics, mm. During the growth phase, exponential dynamics are quite commonly seen. You know, people are familiar with that and bacterial growth, viral replication, that's fine. Each thing produces more copies and those all produce more copies. So that's an exponential process. What do you have to say about the exponential decline? What do we, how do we reason about like the underlying process that, that makes it make sense that it's exponential? Yeah, I mean, in terms of, measuring viral RNA, I suppose we can think about it as like the half-life of RNA. You know, RNA is a molecule that has some stability. So if we just left it, it would decline exponentially over time with relation to its half-life. There is also this background process going on, which I alluded to, which is the immune response as well, which is, you know, there's physically bits, physical bits of virus in there that the immune system's mopping up. And because the kind of growth rate of those immune cells is also increasing exponentially, you can imagine that being the waning rate is also increasing. So here I'm showing you like this really simple schema of just a straight line that goes up and goes down. And in terms like qualitatively that describes the shape of the dynamics quite well, but you can go into a lot more detail in kind of understanding um, the behavior, you know, the longevity of the target of the viral load proxy. So the longevity of viral RNA, you can start modeling things like the when and how strongly the immune system turns on feedback loops between viral populations and immune stimulation. You know, there's a whole field of within those modeling that kind of is more interested in the mechanisms themselves. I mean, for the purpose of this talk though, it's just kind of making the point that we can describe the qualitative behavior. It's quite a simple set of lines. Right on, thanks. Yeah, so, so, the point of, so the point is, you know, we have a within host process that follows a fairly standard trajectory. But of course, during an epidemic, we have people at different states of infection over time. So this top right here is kind of showing you this generic population of people during an epidemic, but some are infected, some are exposed, some are recovered. So if we were to simulate their viral trajectories over the course of an epidemic, we would see that there's this massive mixture of viral loads over time. So that's what we're kind of interested in getting at. Okay, so this is now gonna be the methods -y bit, which is an untested um, presentation for me. So we're gonna see how it goes, but I'm gonna kind of talk through how we fitted this model to some existing data and then how we used it to simulate viral load distributions um, to underpin our analysis on pool testing. So this is a paper that we published recently, um, looking at using these ideas and using these concepts to better understand and optimize pool testing designs under resource constraints. And this is also gonna hopefully lead nicely into David's talk later on. Okay, so this is the data that we're kind of interested in characterizing. So our aim is to model viral kinetics. So to model this kind of up and down shape. And also we want to model how much these kind of kinetics vary across individuals, right? So we're interested in simulating populations of viral loads. So this is data from a few hospitalized patients um, from Munich, Germany early last year. And the key features I want you to take away are firstly that there, is there are some consistent patterns here. Firstly, that from the time of first sample, you see this monotonic decline in viral load. So these, for example, this orange line going down monotonically, you know, it's, and it starts at its highest around the time of symptom onset typically. But there's also substantial variation. So not only does the rate of, the rate of decline vary across these three individuals, but it also varies substantially based on where, which, what sample type you've taken, so where you've sampled viral material from. 
So we're interested in coming up with a really simple model that captures those features. So kind of the overall dynamics of up and down and the variation across individuals. And this is a very fun, well, to me, because I'm not, I don't have a maths background, you know, writing these in equations looks very fancy, but this is just a set of piecewise linear um, equations that say R only goes up, then it goes down. Okay, so this slide is going to get really busy by the end, but I'm going to try and walk through it slowly. And what I'm going to do is kind of illustrate how um, I went about, or we went about fitting this in a Bayesian framework. So we're interested not in just finding a single kind of point estimate that describes these trajectory as well, but understanding distributions. So these are the same three individuals, the same three data sets. And I've added some extra space on the x-axis because you might have noticed before that, you know, those were taken, the x-axis started say four days post-symptom onset, but we're interested in understanding the dynamics far, you know, before people get sick. So right from the time they get infected. So this is what we're trying to capture. So we use our viral load model and we can kind of draw some arbitrary line that fits through that data quite nicely. And we can kind of, we can do that fitting by assuming that observations are normally distributed about this mean uh, viral load trajectory. Okay, so we're assuming normally distributed observation, observations about some unknown mean trajectory. And just to kind of spell it out really explicitly, we have this, um, this model is um, kind of solved using this parameter vector theta. And theta is comprised of this set of parameters that describe this kind of timing of key events with regards to the viral trajectory. So I don't, I'm not interested in kind of telling you exactly what each parameter means, but just to understand that you know, we have a vector of individual parameter values that we wish to estimate. So what we can do is we can think about, well, there's are some, all those, and are all those parameters individual specific or are some of them global? Ah, so that's exactly what I'm going to get to. And I will explain that just in a second. Sorry, this is Alex and thanks James. No worries, Alex. Yeah, so at the moment we're assuming that we're fitting kind of independent trajectories to each individual. And what, we, what we're interested in doing is, okay, we have a set of, or a, a space of possible parameter values. So each of these kind of parameters has a space in which they could take viable values. And if we were to simulate or draw from that space and solve the model, we can evaluate how well that trajectory fits the data. And ultimately what the point of doing this in a Bayesian framework is, is that we can kind of resample from this space in a clever way many, many times and eventually kind of draw enough samples to understand the posterior distribution of these parameters conditional on the data. So these kind of probability densities are just showing you regions of parameter space that are well, they're very congruent with the data. And then the kind of low density regions are regions that are not very congruent. So yeah, so the this is great if we want to just kind of fit to individuals, but we're interested in kind of simulating out of sample um, individual trajectories. And you also might notice that there's things like you know, this region of parameter space here, we don't have any data. So we're kind of, there's an infinite set of, or almost an infinite set of uh, lines that could fit through this blank space. So all of these can be solved by considering the priors that we use. So the priors being kind of our prior belief on the structure and values that these parameter values should take. And so exactly as Alex is kind of alluding to, so the way that we get around this is that we do all this fitting in a hierarchical model. So rather than assuming that each individual has their own set of parameter values, we assume that those individuals have their parameters drawn from a higher population level distribution. So rather than each individual have it, well, each individual has its own alpha, but there is also a distribution of alphas described by um, a distribution with mean alpha bar and standard deviation sigma alpha. So in this way, we kind of simultaneously estimate the parameters for each individual and also the distribution of those parameters across many individuals, so in an, arbit in an arbitrary population. And so really going back to the prior point, that means that we can then borrow information between individuals as well. So that gives us more information about parts of the viral trajectory that are less data rich for some individuals than it is for others. That's a great answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I knew you were going to ask it. <laughs> yeah. And just to kind of highlight then what this means for our simulation framework. So each individual has an alpha an alpha, which kind of in this case dictates the height of the viral trajectory. We assume that those alphas are drawn from a population distribution described by mean alpha bar and standard deviation sigma alpha. And all of these parameters are unknown. We estimate all of them simultaneously conditional on these individual level data. And that gives us a distribution on alpha bar and alpha, sigma alpha that we can then use to simulate new individuals. So we're, similar, we're using the data from these three individuals to come up with distributions that we can simulate an arbitrary number of individuals from. 
So all of that's just to say, we can use the data to come up with these big distributions that we can simulate of the sample data. And then hey, to James. tie this, hey, sure. So, I mean, I don't know if you're gonna come back to it and I know you don't wanna get into like exactly what each individual parameter is. Mm. Um, it was maybe on one of the earlier slides where you show the sort of the cartoon with exposed, infected, and yep. then removed from the population. But I think it is worth saying, so like what, yeah, roughly what are the dynamics we try and capture, um, again, without necessarily enumerating each individual parameter? Yeah, so, the, so basically like what we want to do is we want to just have a simple model as possible that describes viral loads over the entire course of an of a, um, infection. And the way that we do that is we're kind of uh, anchoring these straight lines at different points in time with respect to the infection. And the, these anchor points are chosen because they're easy to intuit and they're kind of, there's other data that allows us to um, kind of place strong priors. So for example, we, we know that for most viral infections, there's a short latent period before you experience any viral growth. We know that there's a kind of, gonna, then once viral growth start, there's a, starts, there's a time that it takes to then reach peak viral load. So TP. We know that um, for people that get sick, there's a incubation period. So a, a kind of distribution of times from infection to onset of symptoms, T ink. And then because most data are kind of taken after people get sick, when you can notice them, um, we also describe this waning rate, TW, which is the time from um, symptom onset to loss of detectability. And then we also have this alpha, which is describing the height. So how high your viral load gets, what's the peak viral load you reach in the infection. So yeah, again, all of this is just like anchor points for the kind of this straight line model, but kind of written in such a way that it has makes biological sense. Great, thanks. Yeah, so just to, so, so just to go back to um, so kind of diversion to methods, to go back to the point of this is that we're kind of interested in generating simulated populations of viral loads that match what we see in reality. to then kind of have a system that we can test new methods on. So this kind of took place in three stages. So we use this hierarchical model to fit two viral load data from a set of individuals. And that gave, that gave us distributions of viral trajectory parameters. So here we now, we're now gonna simulate infection times using an S, classic FEIR model. So, in, so the rate of infections changes over time and we use that to simulate new infections over time. And then for each individual that gets infected, we say, okay, you're now infected. We give you a set of viral kinetics parameters drawn from these distributions from before. And then we can simulate individual level trajectories in the population over the course of the outbreak. So each of these kind of striations here is showing you the viral trajectory for one individual as they arise through this SEIR model. And so the reason that this is important is because once you do this, you realize that actually viral load distributions are not kind of static with time, you know. They change depending on the, the stage of the epidemic. And I'm going to come back, hopefully this is the thing I'm going to come back to at the end when I have more time, but just to say that during the growth phase, you can see that, you know, if you take this straight line down here, so the epidemic is growing rapidly, we have a distribution of CT values of viral loads that have far more low viral loads. Whereas more in the decline phase here, we have a distribution of viral loads that's skewed much closer to the limit of detection. We have very few low CT values, very few high viral loads. And so what you can imagine is that based on these distributions of viral loads in the population, we expect there to be different behaviors of tests based on their sensitivity and the limits of detection, because the kind of shift of this distribution towards or away from the limit of detection depends on the epidemic dynamics. Okay, so that's our um, kind of framework for simulating these data. Um, and that's like kind of getting, giving you the idea of uh, how within based models interact with epidemic, epidemic models to generate kind of interesting patterns at the population level. I, I have a question. Uh, my name is Luca. If you can go back just one slide. Yeah. So to do this uh, type of analysis, are you assuming that uh, the number of testing is constant during the pandemic or also the... So that's, yeah, that's really good point to bring up. I'm not going to talk about that much today, but the point is that we have, we, we don't need to worry about testing at this point. We're generally, we're simulating kind of the true population level. So at the moment we're assuming everybody's unobserved, right? So this is all true unobserved infections. And, and it, for other, pay, other work we've done, and I don't think I'm going to talk about any of it here, but we can then kind of lay on top of that a different testing strategy, right? It might be that we simulate our tests where we only test people a few days after they get sick. So even though their kind of latent trajectory is undergoing this predictable process, 
we're only identifying them at a certain point in their infection. Or as you say, it might be that we start off testing 1% of the population every week, and by then we test 10% of people every week. And so the, act, the raw numbers of tests will change. We can kind of benchmark that against the known true distribution. Uh, uh, I understand your answer. Then I'm a little bit confused why you see this uh, variation in the CT distribution. Is it the statement that if you are in the peak, towards the peak of the pandemic means that people are not careful and so they are infecting each other when they are the highest value of CT? No, no, so, so this is to say that if we have like a normal outbreak, like a normal SIR model, so a simple outbreak model, we have these kind of true viral loads in the population. If we are to take a truly random cross section at these different points, and just ask, just test those people, their viral loads will change depending on the stage of the epidemic. And I think that later on, I'm going to kind of get into the details of that a bit more. But this is, this is just to make the point that this, this observation arises purely through the interaction of the within-host process and the epidemic process. So James, maybe another way to say it is during epidemic growth, you're mostly sampling people early yeah. in their infection when they have high viral loads and during epidemic decline, you're mostly sampling people or you're more biased to sampling people late in their infections when they have low viral loads. So that's a, that's a spoiler for a cartoon I have in about five slides time. But um, I yes. ruined it. <laughs> no, sorry, it's not, not that interesting. <laughs> okay, anyway, so that, so we're understanding that we have this population of viral loads. So we kind of use this, actually, I'm spending so much time I have. Okay, so, we're gonna use this framework to evaluate in simulation different pooled testing strategies. And the aim here is to kind of identify individual samples. So to reiterate, we've simulated a population of viral loads, known prevalence. We're gonna randomly sample individuals from that population. We're gonna create simulated pools. And by doing that, we're gonna simulate dilution effects. So we're gonna be mixing negative samples and positive samples. And then we're gonna test different inference methods on these simulated pools to identify pooling strategies that are um, optimized under some kind of criteria. So I don't want to spend too much time on this because Brian, uh, David's going to talk a lot about this, but just to give you all an idea of what pooling is in terms of um, uh, virological testing. So the idea is basically that we have kind of a set of samples. So say here we have eight samples, A through H. We want to kind of, we want to classify these samples as positive and negative using as few tests as possible. And the way that we can do that is by combining samples and testing the kind of combined pools. So in a simple pooling design, all we, we kind of take these eight samples, we split them into two groups of four, mix them together and test the mixture of four. So in the case of E through H, because no constituent sample is positive, we don't detect any viral RNA in the pool because all the constituent samples were negative. And therefore we conclude that these four samples were all negative. Whereas in the case of A through D, where B was positive, if we assume that there's enough viral RNA in B to not be diluted by being mixed with these negatives, we can still detect this, this pool as being positive. And that says, okay, well, if this pool's positive, one of these original four samples must have been positive. So we can go back and retest those original four samples and lo locate sample B. And the point is here that we've done, we've uh, kind of evaluated eight samples using only six tests. Whereas if we were doing individual testing, we would have, have had to have used eight tests. Um, this is, I'm probably just gonna skip over this because I think hoping David's gonna explain it, but. That simple pooling is like the most basic way of doing it. We can also do combinatorial pooling where we kind of combine samples in clever ways. So we split each sample into multiple pools and the combination of pools that test positive allows us to go back and locate which of the original samples were positive. And in this case, um, you know, the toy example shows that it's just as efficient as simple pooling. But you can imagine that by doing this algorithm more cleverly, it can scale better and has higher efficiency under certain uh, conditions. And so, Again, hopefully Dave will talk about this, but when we talk about pool testing designs, there's a number of kind of variables to kind of keep in our head when evaluating them. So firstly, we need to keep in mind the prevalence in the population. So what proportion of samples that we're testing do we expect to be positive? And the reason that's important is because the more samples that are positive, the more pools test positive, so the more kind of second round tests we need to do. So you can imagine that pooling gets less and less efficient as prevalence gets higher. So for the purpose of this talk, I'm gonna talk about the number of samples N, so how many samples we wanna get through with the given pool strategy. 
the number of pools that those samples are going to go into, so B. So here, this was N equals eight and B equals two. The number of samples that in each pool, so N with little n, which is just big N divided by B. And then in the case of combinatorial pooling, how many pools each sample goes into, so how the split. So in simple pooling, Q, the split is one because each sample goes in one pool. And under different combinatorial designs, that can go up to say two, three or more. So that's our kind of variables for evaluating a particular pooling strategy. What we want to do in terms of this question of um, optimizing um, our design, we're trying to find the strategy that identifies as many positives as possi possible when we have a given number of test kits available and a given number of samples that we wish to get through. So you can imagine that we might go out into the population and swab loads and loads of people, but we only have say a few dozen test kits. So we want to find the strategy that allows us to get through as many of those samples as possible. And so what we did is we went off and used our simulated data set and evaluated under each combination of daily testing capacities and sample collection capacities to so this grid here. We found the pool testing strategy that maximized the number of positives identified. And what you can see is that in the top left where testing capacity outstrips sample collection capacity, you may as well test all samples individually. But as you creep further down to the right and um, testing capacity starts being limiting, we kind of shift towards these more and more complex com uh, pooling designs. So on the kind of um, diagonal here, where we have nearly enough tests, but not quite, it makes sense to do simple pooling. And as we kind of get vastly, um, our, our sample collection capacity vastly outstrips our testing capacity, it makes more sense to do more and more complex designs. And so what you can see is that through doing this, we can make sure that we get keep getting through as many samples as possible, even when we have very limited testing capacity. So that's, that's identifying the optimal strategy in terms of kind of getting through samples. But one of the biggest concerns people have had with pooling is this idea of sensitivity loss. So we alluded to before that if you dilute a positive sample with a negative sample, we potentially dilute that positive sample below the limit of detection and therefore lose sensitivity. So what I'm showing you here is how that sensitivity changes across different pooling strategies, so different levels of dilution, and also as prevalence change, changes during epidemic growth. So what you can see is that from our model, we estimate that testing each sample individually has a sensitivity of about 85%. And then as you kind of pool more aggressively, that sensitivity drops to as low as 70%. So just to bear in mind that for all we're processing more samples and we're identifying more positives overall, we might still be missing some positives. And so this is important to understand if your aim is to say classify individuals in a clinical setting where you just really want to know, do they have SARS-CoV-2 or not? versus in a public health surveillance setting where we might just want to kind of detect as many positive individuals as possible. So that's sensitivity, but that's being traded off against the efficiency. So, you know, under individual testing, we have to consume a large number of tests per day, but as we pool more and more aggressively, we kind of save on test kits. But as I alluded to before, as prevalence increases, we're doing more and more kind of confirmatory tests, which means that our kind of efficiency is getting worse and worse and eventually you may as well do individual testing once prevalence um, exceeds 10%. So I mentioned that um, I kind of showed you before that kind of distribution of viral load at different stages of the epidemic. So this points out, this is the sensitivity during the growth phase. What's really interesting from doing this in a simulation framework is that we see that actually during the decline phase, all of the sensitivities shift down quite drastically. So even for individual testing during the decline phase, we see that sensitivity drops to 60%. And for some pool testing designs, it drops even lower. And I'm now going to kind of show you exactly why that, um, why that property emerges. So this is my cartoon that kind of shows you um, the relationship between epidemic dynamics and the time since infection, so how old infections are. So when the epidemic is growing, you can imagine that we're getting more and more infections each day, which means that if we observe all infections on a given day, so where this arrow is today, and ask the people that are currently infected, when did you get infected? We'll see that most individuals were infected very recently and fewer infected further in the past. Conversely, when the epidemic is declining, if we do the same thing, we see that most individuals were infected a long time in the past and few individuals were infected recently. So what you can see is that the epidemic dynamics dictates the distribution of infection ages when randomly sampled in the population. And what we kind of saw before is that, well, 
the age of infection. So how long ago you were infected dictates your expected viral load. So people that were recently infected tend to have high viral loads and people that are infected a long time ago tend to have old viral loads. And if we combine those ideas, we can see that the epidemic stage dictates the distribution of infection ages, which in turn dis dictates the distribution of viral loads. So we can see that you know, we expect this distribution of viral loads to change depending on the epidemic stage. And what that means is that during, say, the epidemic decline phase, we have more people with these low viral loads, which are more likely to be missed by a low limit of detection or high limit of detection test. So what that means is that when we're talking about sensitivity and false negatives, not all false negatives are the same because they're much more likely to arise when viral loads are low. Um, and this is just to show you um, in that same simulation, the distribution of these time sense infection distributions and CT values over time. So you can see that the distribution of time sense infection shifts over the epidemic and the CT value distribution also shifts in the same way. And so what this means is that most false negatives are coming from these old infections. So these low viral load individuals and because we've done this in a simulation framework, when we kind of evaluate our pool testing designs, we know exactly which individuals we've missed. So during the epidemic growth phase, 75% of false negatives are coming from people at the tail end of their infection. So more than seven days post symptom onset. So that's this kind of like region of red here on the right. And because we're kind of convolving that distribution with the epidemic growth rate, this, this shifts even further during the decline phase. We have more, even more people uh, missed in this kind of low viral load period during the decline phase. So what this means is that regardless of the stage of the epidemic, most false negatives are coming from individuals who are kind of old infections and have the least onward risk of transmission. And that this is even more severe during the epidemic decline phase. Okay, how am I doing for time? 10 minutes, it's gonna be tight. Does anyone, I know this kind of talked really quickly, does anyone have any questions while I have a drink of water? Can, can those uh, histograms of viral load usefully uh, help us infer things about the trajectory of the pandemic from a snapshot or kind of given the information that's available anyway, is that sort of superfluous? That's exactly what my last few slides, I don't think I'm going to have time to get through, are about. But yes, the answer, the, yeah, the short answer is yes, you can do it. And I'll hopefully have a bit of time to explain why. I, I think you have, uh, you know, 15, 20 minutes or something if you want, James, so. Okay, we'll see. We'll see. You don't need to end at 10 minutes. Yeah, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, we can go till 55 for sure. Okay, cool. Yeah, so, so I'm trying to kind of build up this kind of system of thinking of different ways of doing surveillance that incorporates viral load understanding. So what I've showed then was how to kind of optimize individual sample identification. But in EPI, we're kind of interested in these other kind of population-wide metrics. So one being prevalence. So what is the proportion of people that are infected at a given time in the population? And it turns out we can do prevalence estimation really efficiently using pool testing as well. And the way that um, we did this is we um, went into the literature and found a method that was developed for HIV pool testing. So you basically get HIV patients or people and you measure their antibody type into HIV. You pool it and you use the statistical framework to estimate the prevalence of HIV using only a small number of tests. And I'm gonna kind of quickly explain how that works. So let's say we have a sample set of 144 samples. And there's some unknown number of positives or proportion of positives in that sample set. The question is we want to estimate what is the true prevalence in, in this sample set using as few tests as possible. So the, what we can do is we can split the sample set into three pools, so three pools of 48, and measure the viral load in each of those three pools. So we have three measurements, Y1 through Y3. So what we can do is because we know for, through our kind of model, we know the expected distribution of CT values amongst infected people. We can use that idea to write down a conditional probability of observing the uh, kind of given CT value or viral load in a pool, conditional on the unobserved number of positives in the sample. And you know, to cut a long story short, what we can do is we can kind of plug that idea into a maximum likelihood framework to estimate the most likely prevalence that generated the sample set conditional on the three um, viral load measurements we've taken and the unobserved number of positives. So by integrating over the possible number of positives K, we can find the maximum likelihood estimate for P conditional on those three viral load measurements. So all this is just to say that we can estimate prevalence 
based on these only using three measurements by using this kind of understanding of viral load distributions. And to show you how that kind of translates into practice, so we kind of evaluated how good this framework is in a simulation study. And what we did is we kind of, at different levels of prevalence, we tested different pooling designs to see how good is this, this method at estimating the true prevalence. So for each of the, so these kind of labels here are showing you how many samples we kind of take from the population, how many pools we split those samples into, um, and then how good are we at estimating the true prevalence. So what I want you to just look at in each of these plots is we have a true prevalence, which is the uh, red dots here. And what we're looking for is horizontal lines as we go further right. So we have true prevalence in the population. We take a binomial sample from the population, which means we introduce some variation just through doing the sampling. And then we're kind of using a maximum likelihood framework to go back and try and re-estimate that true prevalence. And what you can see is that when prevalence is high or when we have a large number of samples, we do a really good job at, job at accurately estimating true prevalence. So this, these lines stay horizontal as you go across. However, we need to be careful because if our prevalence is really low and we don't take enough samples, sometimes we just don't end up sampling any positive individuals or we have false positives, which mess up our inference. So this kind of simulation is showing you how we can kind of optimize our accuracy, um, based, how we can optimize our pool testing accuracy to a given setting and a given uh, prevalence. And this slide, I don't think, I'm not gonna talk about this in much detail, but this is just to show that um, Ryan and his team went and actually validated that this works in um, a lab, a set of lab experiments. So with kind of a, a set of tr um, um, previously tested nasopharyngeal swabs, making fake pools of um, fake prevalence and then using this method to re-estimate true prevalence. And what we found is that even in the lab setting, we could re-estimate the true prevalence of 1% accurately using 48-fold fewer tests than would have been required to test each sample individually. So this is just to say that, you know, we have this proposed method, it works in the lab, and it would allow, say, resource-constrained settings, if they wanted to, to go out and perform epidemi epidemiologic surveillance using a very small number of test kits. So getting a handle on prevalence by only using, say, 48 test kits, which sounds like not very many, but with the colleagues we talked to in the Gambia, particularly earlier last year, that is the kind of testing throughput that was available to them. You know, they only had a few dozen tests to use per day, and most of those would be reserved for the clinical setting. Okay, so yeah, my last kind of few minutes, I'm gonna very briefly talk about um, the question that was asked before, which is, you know, we, we have this now link between the epidemic trajectory, the within host process of the viral loads and the observed distribution of CT values at different points in the epidemic. And so you should, you should imagine, well, we should then be able to, if we can describe the system well, we should be able to estimate one of those three things given knowledge of the other two. And so we have a preprint on this that's currently in review and it's exactly on this topic, um, which is uh, underpinned by the following logic. So CT values, which are the results from um, COVID tests are observations of viral loads. So the observations of the viral loads in people that we've tested. We've seen before from the kind of within host process that those viral loads are proxies for the time since infection. So those viral loads change depending on how old your infection is. And we've also seen that the distribution of time since infection are related to the epidemic dynamics. So if we kind of tie all this together, we can use the CT value distribution to infer the epidemic dynamics by modeling these kind of links correctly. And yeah, so this is exactly the point of this slide here was to show you how those things link together. So given knowledge of the viral load distribution on the right and given knowledge of the mapping between time sense infection and viral loads, we can go back and re-estimate our unobserved viral um, epidemic curve. And this is kind of showing you those things spelled out. So we have these three components, the probability of infection curve, the probability of CT values given infection, which is the viral load model, and those things combine to give an expected CT distribution. So the idea here is that if we observe three and we assume something about two, we can go back and re-estimate one. And this is a whole talk on its own. So I just want to leave a tantalizing GIF um, and kind of link to our preprint if you're interested in finding out more. Um, where we, we went and kind of formalized all this idea, these ideas. And what we came up with was a method where we could use, do non-parametric inference of the epidemic incidence curve using cross-sectional viral load distributions. So what's being shown here is from a simulation framework. So we have a simulated true incidence curve in the red here. Each week we add on, say, a, a small cross-section of viral, load, viral loads. 
and we continually update our estimate of the underlying epidemic incidence curve. What you can see is that by using the kind of CT distribution, rather than just the binary number of positives and negatives, we can kind of maintain this very accurate estimate of the epidemic incidence curve. Okay, so that's everything I wanted to talk about. So just to kind of summarize. Hey, James, I have a question. Yeah. So this is very cool. So can you say something about, so, I mean, we, you, you talked about the model um, of within host viral kinetics and also the epidemic growth model, the SEIR model and the interplay between those is what allows you to gain these additional insights. In order to build this model, I realize you didn't get into the details of exactly what the model is, but the, the concept is clear enough. Can you say what's needed in terms of prior data or training data or anything else? So it's the same, it's the same principles as the hierarchical model I showed at the start. So first that we need to understand how viral loads change over the course of infection and how they vary. So we can use the data we had before, but that's fine if all kind of um, testing platforms are the same. So a CT value in one machine means the same in another machine, which isn't the case. So we can, there's kind of, to me, there's two parts of this kind of calibration. So one is, what are the features of the viral trajectory curve that are independent of platforms, so biological properties? And these are things like um, how long it takes to reach peak viral load, how long it takes for you to clear the infection. So those things we can, uh, we can infer based on other kind of, other data sets that are kind of transcend the testing platform. But then there's also parts of it that we need to kind of calibrate to a particular setting. So what does a CT value of 30 mean in terms of viral load in location A versus location B? So all of those things, we kind of need to be very careful of making sure that our model uh, simulates data that accurately represents the setting that we're kind of applying this method to. So I think that's it. It's like the, we need to understand the biological parts of the model and also the kind of um, testing part of the model. So what does a particular value mean? So that's the kind of viral load bit. The probability of infection model, well, this can actually be any arbitrary um, probability of infection curve. So in our paper, we kind of evaluate a suite of things. So we could just assume there's an exponential growth curve, so just an exponential process. We can observe, assume there's an underlying simple compartmental model, an SEIR model. So just a very constrained up and down curve. Or, and, and this is kind of showing you the kind of ultimate shebang of it all which is assuming a kind of non-parametric incidence curve. So we just use the Gaussian process model to kind of have this flexible wiggly shape. So yeah, so there does need to be some calibration based on the platform you have, but you know, it's very doable. And in, in the paper, we do this to two different um, data streams. Very cool. And so I guess importantly, while you might need to know something about what happens within individuals, Kind of the whole deal is you don't no, need to know anything about the history of the epidemic uh, which means that you could take a snapshot at a current time and get an estimate of the current growth rate or decline. That's exactly right. yeah so i have a maybe i have a backup slide um let's see so so we actually went and did this with some data from nursing homes so what we had is nursing homes in massachusetts went through these kind of three rounds of complete sampling so this top plot is showing you the point prevalence in a given nursing home in Massachusetts over time. So at three something rounds. And over and they were also all staff and residents were sampled. So you can fit like a classic compartmental model to the prevalence curves and get like a reconstruction epidemic. But what we found is that you can take each one of these samples on its own, so just a single cross section, that gives you a, a distribution of CT values. And then you can use it to re-estimate the same SEIR model using the single cross section. And you can see that for all it's a lot more, there's a lot more noise because you know, we're using less data. We qualitatively get the kind of reconstruct the pattern of the outbreak pretty well using that single cross section. So absolutely, this is like another, we think this is another tool where, you know, we've kind of looked at the idea of prevalence testing, efficient prevalence testing in a resource constrained setting. We also think, you know, you could do this incident um, estimation in a resource constrained setting by also going up and doing a single cross section of samples. I think it's totally awesome. And Thank you. have you thought thought about? Uh, I mean, I've seen it before in things, obviously, but I still think it's awesome every time I see it. Um, have you thought about like in so 
when would this be most useful? Well, it would be useful lots of times where you just don't have a handle on what's going on out in the community, which obviously we observed a ton over the last year. Um, but one would think it might be extremely important at stages where prevalence is still pretty low, where you're maybe like at the, you know, you're not, you're not, you haven't been testing for months and months. Um, so do you know how it performs in kind of tail cases or again, especially when prevalence is like very low? So, so when prevalence is very low, the problem is that you, you obviously need to go and sample a load of people to get like enough positives to get an idea of the distribution, right? So I think it would work complete, like there's no reason it won't work well at any prevalence level, but we just need to be aware of if you're kind of trying to get an idea handle when prevalence is super low, we probably have to swab thousands of people to get like say 50 positives to build up an accurate estimate of the distribution. So that's kind of the way to think about it is like, well, what sample size do you need? Um, in terms of how this is most useful, I think what you've said is exactly right, which is, it's, it's very easy, particularly in the US, to think, oh, but testing capacity is so good now, we don't need these kind of cleverer methods. But we're kind of forgetting that last, last year, one, we had very little testing, so we had no spare testing capacity for epidemic surveillance. And two, we did have this kind of epidemic of test numbers. So people were inferring, you know, using case counts, so just the raw number of new positives as kind of a metric of epidemic growth. But that's not the kind of true estimate of incidence because if obviously if you're scaling up testing and cases are scaling up, you're going to massively overestimate the growth rate. And so um, to allude to a previous question, by using the distribution and not just the raw numbers of tests, you actually get an unbiased estimate of the growth rate that is kind of um, doesn't care about the actual number of data points because all the information is in the distribution, not in the raw numbers. And so in, the, in this preprint, we kind of show how that compares, how if you use like a classic case count based method to estimate growth rate, how that's really biased when testing capacity changes, but using the distribution based method is unbiased. So that's another place that it makes sense is like if you use this kind of distributional information when testing capacity is changing, you can kind of keep a handle on the bias. Right, but I guess if you're biased in terms of which samples you collect, then you're kind of in bad shape yeah. no matter what. You're doing. Yeah, so that's a whole other kind of worms, which is um, we, we kind of looked at this in like a kind of random cross-sectional sense. So in places like the UK, we're doing um, truly random cross-sectional samples of the population where we go out and just test like thousands of people at random. And that this method is perfect for that. But obviously most data that is based on people coming in to get tested for some reason, you know, they, they've recently got sick, so they get a test which will bias their viral load kind of towards some point in their infection course. And so we actually have, so colleagues at um, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine are trying to use these ideas, trying to account for those ideas in the current um, surveillance uh, methods. So you can kind of, let me, let me see. So, so what, what, what you're kind of alluding to is there's a, there's a fourth feature to this relationship here, which is the kind of observation delay distribution. So this would be like one times two times observation delay distribution. So if you can account for that distribution here, then you can still use this method, but it just becomes a little bit of a harder inference problem. Got it. So you would have your op by observation distribution. Does that does that specifically mean like uh, how the distribution of CT values? Well, so like what type of people? What what is the distribution over? Like what what type of people? Symptomatic, asymptomatic, etc. We're saying that like the um, we're assuming that we're sampling people at random across this curve here, across the time since infection distribution. Ah, if we got are, it. If we're multiplying that by another probability distribution that's skewing it towards certain parts of this curve, then we need to account for that because that will kind of skew this expected distribution. Perfect. And one of the reasons, so one of the things I didn't get to but that's really important or why we think this is important is because people are using CT distribution at the population level to start inferring that new variants of concern have higher viral loads and are more virulent. But you know, we've seen in the simulation framework that we actually expect the distribution of viral loads to change depending on whether a particular variant is growing or declining. So if we have a variant that's declining in incidence, then those CT values will be much higher. And if we have a variant at the same time that's increasing, those CTs will be much lower. So we would see that those variants have different distributions, but it's nothing to do with the biology of the virus, it's purely to do with the epidemic process. Today I'm going to be talking about 
simple, flexible, and effective pool testing uh, using these things called hypergraph factorizations. Uh, and so this is work that um, uh, maybe similar to James, also uh, we sort of started working on this uh, motivated uh, by um, kind of the uh, COVID uh, pandemic. And so this work with um, Ronak and Xiong at Harvard, um, uh, Brian at the Broad and uh, Edgar also at Penn with me. So, yep, okay. So um, kind of revisiting now, uh, James already introduced pool testing. So I'm gonna sort of revisit again here. And that's gonna be kind of the, uh, the main goal of this talk is gonna be mainly about how should we do, you know, how might we do pool testing? What are some kind of ways we might do this? Uh, please do feel free to also, um, uh, you know, jump in and interrupt with questions. You know, I've tried to make it, hopefully try to make it slightly interactive. We'll have some questions for folks to answer at some point. Uh, so, so please do feel free. Okay. Um, Great. Okay, so the goal here is to try to screen more people with fewer tests, right? Given that we have limited testing constraints, things like this, uh, we'd like to be able to use them more effectively to cover more people. Okay, and so here's uh, classical uh, Dorfman pooling. Uh, and so uh, Dorfman pooling has uh, a first stage, which is pooled testing, uh, which uh, James uh, discussed briefly. And uh, here I've got an example with 100 individuals, and uh, so each of these, you know, uh, people here, and we're going to divide them up into m equals 10 pools. So um, you know, each of these columns here is one pool. Okay, and um, now in this kind of example, we've got one infected individual, this, uh, this red person here, which is gives us a prevalence of 1% in this example. Okay. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to run these pool tests, and you can see, you know, all of these are negatives, but here we have a positive. And so that positive uh, pool to test is going to lead us to call all the people in that pool putative positives. And so um, we think that there's someone positive within that pool. And this leads us to a second stage where we're now going to test the putative positives individually to identify uh -huh, this was the person that was infected, right? So we just took the people in this pool and took them over there to uh, pool testing. Okay, so um, Let's take a look here. So we've screened in this case, 100 individuals <clears throat> to, and we found the one infected person. Uh, now, how many tests do we use? So there were the 10 that were kind of in our original uh, uh, 10 pool tests in stage one. Now um, there were uh, uh, 10 individuals now identified as putative positives who had to be individually tested. So that gives us 10 more tests. And so that lands us with a total of 20 in this example, right? So in this example, rather than having to use 100 tests in order to screen 100 individuals, we're able to uh, screen all 100 of them with only 20 tests. Or maybe put another way, um, if we only had those 20 tests available, then we could have, you know, alternatively only screened 20 people. You know, maybe if we did the first 20, we wouldn't have even seen that person. Um, but in this case, we're able to screen 100 and, and actually find that person. Okay, so um, in this case, we get this kind of improvement of five times in efficiency. Great. So this, um, what we're gonna kind of talk about today generally follows the same kind of overall form of this design uh, and of this sort of uh, method, group testing method. So uh, let me maybe pause here for a moment. Are there any questions on this? Is this absolutely clear? Great. Okay. So uh, it's pretty exciting to see that actually this is also uh, you know, being used uh, now at the Broad. And so this is Dorfman pooling in action at the Broad. So there's a, I guess, kind of fairly recent, I guess, news article talking about uh, pooling being used for K through 12 testing. And so here, um, now you'll have to forgive me, I'm not, uh, I'm not, I don't maybe have as much biological training. So someone jump in, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe each of these uh, are the, um, are the tubes here and inside of them are a bunch of swabs. And so each of these is basically a pool in, 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 in their testing setup. Okay, I see some nodding heads. So at least I didn't got that right. Um, and so, uh, and of course, Brian was also involved in this overall work. So Brian also feel free to jump in with corrections. Uh, so you know, I thought it's kind of cool to see though, you know, already they've done 15,000 pools and uh, representing approximately 84,000 people. So I guess that was even, I don't know, uh, a couple weeks ago now. So maybe it's even higher now. And here they're doing pooling with five to 10 swabs uh, in the tube. And exactly what we talked about a moment ago, right? If a pool is found to be positive, 
um, what they're gonna do is uh, they're going to retest people individually in the pool to identify who has the virus. Okay, great. So uh, let's take a closer look. Um, so how does Dorfman assign individuals to pools? So eventually you have a bunch of individuals and you need to, you know, when you're doing pool testing, you need to assign them into the pools that you have. So how are you gonna do that? Well, Dorfman does it in the following way. So each individual is assigned to only to exactly one pool and it's done by essentially cycling through the list of pools. So here on the right, uh, what I've done is I've taken, you know, pool. I, well, first I've, I've given some names to our pool. So let's call them A through J. <clears throat> and then now if I arrange them in a circle like this, then uh, what we're essentially doing is well, individual one, we put in pool A. Now we go to individual two, we kind of continue around the circle, pool B then C, D, and so on, right? Once we hit 10, now we've used up all the pools, we return to the beginning. And so that's pretty much, we're going through this first row here. And then now we're on this person and we go back to A and then we continue, okay? And so um, this is quite a nice and, and simple scheme and, and actually an advantage uh, of this kind of design is that it's really simple, right? It's sort of, if you just kind of go through all the, <clears throat> go through all the pools one by one, you just assign them to individuals, you know, whatever number of individuals you have, you could go that long and stop. Um, and so, um, yeah, it makes, it makes it really flexible and, and nice. Uh, but another feature is that since you're kind of going through the pools like this, and then sort of using up all the pools once before you start using them again, the result is gonna be that the, the pools are gonna be pretty much balanced, as balanced as possible. Okay, because you're never going to sort of put a bunch of people into one pool before you start kind of taking advantage of the other pools. And so um, this kind of balance also is nice because it helps facilitate robust implementation in the lab. And so these are really great features actually of, uh, of the Dorfman uh, kind of design. Okay, but oh, interesting. This is, uh, I haven't seen this before, but I guess PowerPoint's acting up. So, uh, but the limitation here is that, um, is that Dorfman pooling can be suboptimal. And so uh, uh, in particular here, because uh, we're putting each individual in only one pool. And uh, it turns out that if you put uh, individuals in more than one pool, you can sort of take advantage of that additional information to gain more efficiency. Okay, so this is a limitation of Dorfman pooling. Right, so the question is, uh, can we do more efficient pooling by somehow extending Dorfman's design? In particular, we'd like to try to assign individuals to multiple pools, so Q greater than one. All right, so here's kind of a naive approach. Uh, one might first do is, well, take all the possible pool pairs. There's, uh, well, let's see, we've got six pools in this example, A through F. So that gives me uh, six choose two, which is 15 possible pool pairs. So A, B, A, C, B, C. So I just list them in order, uh, A, B, A, C, A, D, so on. And then I'm gonna cycle through these ones, okay? So individual one, a, B, individual two, A, C, three, A, D, and so on, okay? Great, so this is you know comparably simple maybe, and it's sort of nice in that sense, but let's see if there's an issue. So, you know, particular, hey, um, yep. So just to clarify, when you say pool A, B, that's actually two pools, right? That means individual one has part of their sample go in pool A and part of their sample go in pool B. Right? Yes, exactly. Yes, thank you. That's a, yes, good to clarify. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, so this is uh, split into two pools, A and B. Yes, and then there's six pools here. So A through F, A, B, C, D, E, F. David, yep. uh, this is Alex. Um, is there any practical barrier to splitting samples just because that's actually hard to implement in a, in a or is that not an issue? I'm not a, a lab scientist either. But. Um, okay, well, let's see, maybe I might, maybe it's better if I can turn this over to Brian. Uh, my understanding is that uh, actually this is in some sense a limit. Uh, this is a, it doesn't in, introduce some logistical burdens. Uh, and so you want to try to, in fact, what we're gonna try and do is limit the amount of times we split. So for example, we're gonna only try to split two or three times rather than say, you know, six or 10 times. Um, and sort of the balancing game maybe there is how much efficiency gain do you get versus how much of the, you know, kind of implementation um, difficulties do you introduce? And so, um, but yeah, yeah. I, I wonder, Brian, if you might have more thoughts on that. Yeah, that's right. I mean, so the way it's done at the Broad and other places around the world is you don't split the samples at all because, you know, it's the simple design where each sample is going into a single pool. So in fact, 
they just swab and stick the swabs as was shown in the picture that are being combined in pool A or whatever, the swabs go in there directly. They're not like captured. I mean, obviously you're only sticking one swab in each individual person, but like when you stick them in a tube, they all immediately go in the same tube. So um, the downside of that is that you don't necessarily have a stored sample for each individual after the fact because they were all always stored together in a single pool. So there is some logistical challenge to splitting into more at the simplest level. It just means it's like more pipetting steps because you have to pipette each sample, you know, one time per pool. Um, and that doesn't sound so bad, but obviously this stuff is done in rather like sensitive environments. You're working with this virus, potentially you don't know which samples might be infectious. Sometimes it's inactivated depending on what type of sample you're working with, but nonetheless, you're treating it with caution. And so there's a lot of individual steps of uncapping the sample, uncapping the pool, pipetting from that's one exactly, to the other. Yeah, that's exactly why I asked. I was kind of vaguely imagining so that sample splitting would introduce uh, an additional step that might actually uh, be a, a, a significant burden to a lab. Correct. And so as David will say, you know, we kind of operate under the assumption that especially in places where they're going to be doing things by hand, having the simplest possible design with like few number of splits and other measures of simplicity is going to be the most amenable uh, to actual laboratory practice. There are other concerns like um, for things to be done by robots, depending on the type of the sample, like sputum samples are super viscous. You could do a pretreatment if you want to, to make them easier to pipette. Um, but yes, generally there are very real practical constraints encouraging the simplest possible designs. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, and this is a great question also because this was one of the large motivations for the work we're doing here, um, largely in that you, know, you wanna try and find a way to get more efficiency, uh, but you have these sort of um, practical considerations. You wanna try and keep the number of splits small, things like that. Yeah, great. Um, so, um, okay, great. So, so supposing we're doing splitting, we might try and do it this way at first. Uh, but one problem that arises here is that the pools are not balanced. So let's look at everyone that's in pool A. So individual one, two, three, four, one through five are all in A. You know, in B, we've got uh, one, six, seven, and eight. And you can see, for example, you know, pool F has just one person, right? Uh, whereas pool A has got five people. Uh, these things are not balanced, which um, probably only makes those practical considerations even harder. Um, uh, but moreover, actually, um, this leads to uneven dilution. And, and as James was talking about, this dilution can have a significant impact. Uh, in particular here, uh, one thing to note is that the sensitivity will be uneven. So notice individual one is in pools A and B, which are large pools. And so this individual is more likely to have a false negative or is at higher risk of a false negative, say, than individual five, who's basically got a pool to themselves. Okay, great. So this is a problem. Um, and so in fact, there's been tremendous study on pool testing in general, and actually much more than we can review today. Um, and so today's goal I'm gonna focus on is this question about, well, how can we assign individuals to pools in a balanced way? And uh, yeah, and so in particular, well, what do I mean by balanced? Uh, the first one I wanna be balanced is in the number of pools that each individual is split into. Uh, and so in particular here, if you look on the left, right, individual two is in only one pool, three is in two pools. So I, I don't want designs like this. I want designs like on the right, everyone is in two pools uniformly. Okay, and this is also going to, you know, uniformity here is also going to mean uh, uniformity in terms of sensitivity and things like this. And so we want to have some kind of um, uh, uh, even or fair kind of design in that sense. All right. Secondly, uh, I want to assign the pools as evenly as possible. So here on the left, this is actually the example I just showed. You can see again, A is assigned a bunch of times, F only once. And so what I want is something like on the right here, you've got A, a is assigned twice. Uh, B is assigned twice, C is assigned uh, twice, everything is assigned twice, okay? Great. Finally, I'm also gonna want the possible pool combinations to be used as evenly as possible. So another design you could have, you know, one of my thought of is, you know, going A, B for the first one. So the first person goes into pools A and B, second person goes into pools C and D, third person E and F, and then you just repeat, All right? But here notice, we never use a combination of A and C, for example. And so uh, the design on the right um, sort of tries to spread those out. 
Great. And then finally, we also want this to do, we want to be able to do this in a way that's easy to adapt and tailor. So for example, if I have, you know, if I want to do a pool test with, you know, slightly more individuals, because I maybe think I've got a lower prevalence, it's sort of worth pooling more aggressively. Well, I want to be able to do that really easily uh, without having to do a lot of work to, to adapt the design. Okay, so these are, these are kind of our goals uh, today. Great. So one approach to try to get that actually is a random design, which is, um, uh, which is what we discussed, which came up a bit earlier. And in particular here, it means, well, each individual you assign to queue the pools chosen uniformly at random. So pick any, you know, pick uniformly at random, let's say two of the pools uh, and assign the individual to that. So an advantage here is that uh, the pools and the pool combinations are gonna be balanced on average. And the reason for that is, well, you know, you can ask what's the probability that I'm gonna put an individual in A or versus B versus C? Well, all of them are uh, six over 15, it's all the same, okay? Likewise, I might ask, well, what's the probability that I use the combination AB versus AC? They're all the same, okay? So on average, I'm gonna be balanced, okay? Uh, but the limitation here is that the random draws are themselves rarely maximally balanced. Okay, and so even though on average we are uh, uh, often we the off individual draws often aren't. And so here I actually I used the random number generator and actually you know chose some random draws and here's what I got. And uh, you'll notice here I actually didn't get any assignments to A, you know, and you can notice here also I use C D and B E twice but never use A B and A C. So it feels like one could be more balanced by, for example, shifting some of those around. And in fact, if we do an exhaustive search of all the possible um, draws you could get, uh, which is possible for this sort of small case, um, you will find that actually only 1.3% of them are actually maximally balanced. Now, a number of them are close perhaps, but, but a, a very few of them are actually um, totally balanced. So one mitigation actually is to search among many draws and pick the most balanced. This is actually a very reasonable approach. Uh, one question you might ask there is, uh, how many draws might we need to get 90% to have a 90% chance of drawing something maximally balanced? And well, here what it is is well, you can calculate the probability of having at least one maximally balanced design. Well, that's the complement is having no maximally balanced designs, and kind of by the previous calculation, uh, it's going to be. 0.987 to the number of runs. And so this is gonna require something like 176 runs to have a 90% chance, okay? And so, um, you know, even, so, so you might have a decent chance of getting a maximally balanced design at that point, but, you know, if you're unlucky, you might still require, uh, you might still need to do some manual tweaking, right? Which can be done, uh, but especially when the designs are big, might actually not be so obvious how to manually tweak the design to make it uh, uh, totally balanced. Great, so this is a kind of a random design approach um, right now. So a second approach is to do an exhaustive search. So you could search through all the possible pool assignments, but, and the advantage here is that it's systematic. We're guaranteed to find the maximally balanced design. But the downside is of course that um, I, had a, I had a professor who liked to sometimes call these also exhausting searches. Um, but the downside here is that, um, you know, it's only practical for small cases, right? So, you know, how big is that search space? What's the number of possible assignments? Well, M again, remember is the um, number of pools. Uh, this is the number of splits. Right, and then N here's the number of individuals, right? And so um, this can grow really large. And so you might have to do a search over a huge space. Uh, granted, actually, this can be significantly even reduced by skipping designs that are sort of obviously unbalanced. You can sort of say, well, you know, I should never do blah, and I can eliminate all those things from my search space. Uh, but it's still kind of rather large. And especially when you want to you know, be able to modify things, um, you know, try different ends, M's, and Q's, you're going to have to rerun it all over again, right? So it's not like you can take one of them, adapt it, and then get the other one. Now you're going to have to sort of start over again. Okay. And so, one might even ask actually, um, you know, is it even obvious that maximally balanced designs exist in general, right? So we had these goals about being balanced in three senses, uh, maximally balanced in three senses simultaneously. Uh, and it's not actually even immediate uh, that, that all three can be uh, achieved at the same time. 
Why, why is it, what's the motivation for searching for the maximally balanced? What, why isn't probably almost balanced good enough? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, in some ways it might be, it might end up being good enough in, in, in terms of the, it might not have a huge impact on the efficiency, things like that. Um, I think one aspect might be that, well, so one aspect may be, okay, so maybe a, 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 um, a quick aspect might be that, well, if you can be maximally balanced, right, then you kind of want to have that one, right? If, if it's out there, you'd like to have it uh, if it's possible. But, um, but yeah, more broadly in terms of the impact, uh, maybe, maybe another aspect actually here might be if you're mostly concerned with say the average uh, performance, uh, like the average efficiency over you know, many runs of this pool testing procedure, uh, then it might even, you know, and if you're using a different random design each time, then actually things might sort of average out anyway. Um, but it's not so clear how that will impact, for example, um, variability of the performance, you know, if you got lucky or unlucky. Um, uh, moreover, you know, if you have something close to balanced, you have to kind of choose, right, like how close is good enough. Uh, so I think it may be introduced a number of these things. But, um, but I do think it's also an interesting question, actually, of, um, you know, how sort of how sensitive, right? The sensitivity yeah. of the performance to the uh, to deviation from being maximally balanced. Yeah, you could test that. You could you could compare the approach you're going to present against just sort of a, the best choice from a, a, a set of random designs. Yeah, so one thing I can say is that in, um, in the, so the previous paper that, um, or sorry, the uh, in the first, I guess the first part of the seminar uh, where uh, the paper James was talking about there, uh, the random design was used there. And if we look at the average performance, it looks kind of similar to what we see for this design. And I think the difference will probably come up in uh, not so much maybe averages, but the uh, maybe, you know, so if you pick one random design and you use it. So, so maybe another consideration here is if you're gonna give a lab or protocol, uh, you probably are gonna pick a design and then give that to them um, ah. rather than ask them to generate a new random one each time, right? And so, yes. um, yeah. But I think if they get to choose a random one each time, then I think in the long run average, they're gonna be, you know, similar, okay. uh, but yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, great I question. A, a great I have a question. question. So getting back to kind of the, the lab SOP type of stuff, they typically have to, or I, my impression is they have to guarantee kind of like uh, sensitivity, like they have hard numbers on things like oh. every test will have this amount of sensitivity and things like that. And so is there, so maybe the average is less important than the worst case or something like that for some of these designs. That's a good point. Yeah, I think that might be, yeah. And this is uh, maybe another reason to, um, yeah, aim for sort of the best we can achieve, things like that. Um, and uh, I think we have some reason to believe that basically the balance helps with the worst case sensitivity. Okay, now we're just made some subtlety and, you know, do I mean worst case to cross individuals, things like that. But um, yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting point. Yeah, thank you. Great. Um, okay, so so let's take a look at what design we get from Hyper, sort of as a kind of maybe sort of sneak peek. So in particular, Hyper is going to take those 15, uh, uh, 15 possible pool combinations and order them in this way. Okay, And so now reading off individual ones, A, B, C, D, then E, F. Uh, notice here we've always, uh, we've used A once, B, and then we're kind of using all the pools before we return back to them. And then now we use B, C, D, F, A, E, and so on. Okay, and so if I collect now, well, let's see who's in pool A. There's two people, pool B, two people. All the pools have two people. Okay, and so, and now if I look at who is in each pool combination, uh, in each sort of pair of pools, well, individual ones in A, B, and you can see this is sort of as balanced as you can be, right? Because, um, you know, either there's none or there's one. Okay. Now, if I went to, uh, if I, instead of stopping at six individuals, if I went up to eight, uh, then, well, I'll just continue. So six was at AE, so then next is BD, and then AF. And then, so now you can see in red here, these are the uh, individuals seven and eight who got added. And you can see that actually the balance is preserved here, right? So the, uh, the pools are not totally even in size. They're not totally balanced because that's actually impossible for this number, but they're as balanced as is possible, okay? And so, um, right. So um, you can kind of see that actually this is kind of, in some ways you can sort of just read off the circle, keep going and you could design the pool. Uh, you could come up with a pool design for any number of individuals. Um, so it makes that uh, step kind of simple. 
okay, but how, how on earth do we get this design, right? Where did this come from? Um, and so that's going to be where this hypergraph factorization comes in. So the idea is going to be to take another angle, to consider another angle on the problem, which is this uh, angle of hypergraph factorization coming from uh, combinatorics and graph theory. And so the idea here is, well, think of pool, think of the pools. Remember, there were six pools, A through F, as some vertices in a graph. Okay, so here I've got A, B, C, D, E, F. Okay, so the vertices are pools. Well, then every pool assignment, at least for the case of Q equals two, when we're doing pairs, is going to be an edge connecting two of the vertices. So for example, A, B, this is one of the pool assignments. Okay, so these are all the edges. This is all the possible individual pool assignments, right? So we can form this graph. We call this K62. So this is six vertices split two ways, six pools split two ways. Um, and um, right. And if I kind of list, you know, kind of there, all the all the edges here are are put together. But if I separate them out, well, there's 15 of them. So A, B, A, C, and so on. Makes sense. So this is sort of just another way, in some ways, of stating. Uh, the pool, the kind of design, right? So this is sort of another way of looking at it. Okay, so an edge is in an that individual. sense, it's on you. No, go ahead. Sorry, David. So an edge is an individual. Uh, roughly, yes. In particular, um, here, for example, if we look at, if, if we used um, this list of 15, um, oh, let me say it this way, uh, an edge is an individual for the first 15, right? But then when you get to individual 16, what do you do? Well, you go back. So then you reuse them uh, and see, so yeah. I see, so, okay, yeah. Does that, does that make sense? Or does that yeah. clarify? An edge is an assignment. Great question. And each individual gets an assignment. Okay, and it doesn't have to be an exactly. edge. Exactly. Edge is if it's to two pools and if an individual is assigned to three pools, it would be a, a hyper edge, like a, a subset of three vertices. Yes, you, it's as if we planned it. Um, great, so. Um, great, so yeah, exactly, exactly. So here, okay, it's a bit harder to draw hyper edges. And so this, this is where I sort of settled for, but um, here we can think of hyper edges here as a, as a set of three pools, exactly, right? Uh, and this will be an assignment to, yeah, that's a good way of saying it, an assignment to the pools A, B, C. And individuals are gonna get put into one of these hyper edges. And so that's where, that's where a hyper comes from, is from the fact that it's not just edges, but it's sort of potentially, you know, these sort of triangles and things like that, which are sometimes called hyper edges. Okay, and then the corresponding object of all the hyper edges is called a hypergraph. Great, so um, yeah, so okay, so there's 20 hyper edges here corresponding to all possible choices of three pools to assign to. Great, so um, here now if I take the, uh, if I, so now, now that we kind of have this language or this sort of way of looking at the problem, going back to the design that I showed that hyper uses. Well, if we take the first three of them, A, B, C, D, and E, F, and I'm not drawing the graph and I'm only gonna draw the corresponding edges. So A, B, C, D, E, F. Okay, and notice here, this sort of forms a graph where every vertex gets used exactly once. And also um, uh, every edge, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, that's it, that's it. Okay. Every vertex gets used exactly once. So um, let's see. Um, yeah, so maybe I'll, and, I'll and ask- And they the don't overlap. Thing. Yes, exactly, they, they don't overlap. So yeah, so no vertex is used twice. So could someone, uh, would someone like to propose another? So this is called a one factor, by the way, because each vertex is used one time. Could someone propose another, uh, another choice? This is the interactive bit I alluded to at the beginning, I guess. You just swap, you know, B, C, D, E, F, A. B, C, E, E. Um, F-A. Nice, and how did you come up with that? Oh, you went like this, is it? Yeah. Okay, cool, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right, so you can imagine you know, making another one of these, right? And then now you wanna maybe make another one, right? So you might try to keep going, so then you might say, okay, I've used up, I've used up A, B, C, D, E, F, B, C, D, E, F, A. Okay, what do I have left? Well, I could use A, C maybe. And then, okay, I need to use B, D I think has not been used. And then E F. Oh no, E F dot oh, oh. Okay, so then you can kind of see now it becomes a little tricky to keep going, right? Um, so oh no. <laughs> <laughs> so um, fortunately it turns out actually if you follow the circle though, it's gonna work out. And so uh, here are five separate hypergraph one factors. 
And so none of these, um, okay, so yeah, so now, now I put them inside to sort of see where they correspond. But here again, each one factor uses each vertex once. So this actually is gonna to lead to balanced pools because we don't, uh, we don't reuse pools until we've sort of gone through all of them. And then here, the fact that, that we have an overall factorization that uses each edge once is gonna to lead to balanced pool combinations uh, because we're gonna use all the pool combinations possible uh, before we start reusing them, okay? So this is a hypergraph factorization, okay? What we have right here on the right. This is a hypergraph factorization. Okay, so we have five hypergraph one factors and what we're gonna do to get our design is just kind of put them in order and then make a, make a cycle that way. Okay, any and questions there's, on There's this? nothing special, I guess, about one, two, three, four, five here that they don't need to go in any order. Just, just the fact That's right. that the individual one factors themselves in any order is the hypergraph factorization. Exactly. So any order of these five, and also within each five, any order of these three um, will satisfy uh, kind of at least what we wanted uh, from the design. Now, granted, now you might ask about some other auxiliary uh, goals, right? In which case, in that, that might end up specifying one of them. Uh, but that's not something I think we've thought too much about yet. Great. So uh, let's kind of revisit now our uh, criteria. So is it maximally balanced? Well, yeah, all individuals are assigned the same number of pools. The pools are assigned as evenly as possible because we're sort of using all the pools before we reuse them. And likewise, all the pool combinations are used as evenly as possible because we're gonna use them all of them before we reuse them. And well, is it flexible? For example, is it easy to increase the number of individuals in the batch that, that end the number of people? Well, yeah, because you just keep going in the cycle until you run out of people. Okay, and so um, that's, yeah, so that's kind of a nice feature. So a question might be, well, does a hypergraph factorization always exist? Is this even possible in general, right? Uh, I mean, I did it for this 15, right? Where I could even brute force it, but is this possible in general? And actually the answer turns out to be yes, uh, kind of amazingly, as long as M that's the number of pools is a multiple of Q, the number of splits. So that's the only requirement. And this actually uh, comes from a kind of deep result in combinatorics called uh, Baron Yai's theorem. Um, and in particular, it's sort of, uh, stating this more precisely. So as long as Q divides M, so in other words, M is a multiple of Q, um, this complete hypergraph decomposes into one factors. Okay, so this is sort of in some ways one of the, the kind of the, um, this is sort of a, a key result at the heart of, of what we're doing that sort of enables uh, what we're doing. Okay, but now I said they exist, right? But that's different than being able to make one, right? So, um, you know, how can we efficiently construct one? And so I'm gonna show for Q equals two and uh, for Q equals three, you can check out our paper, uh, but for Q equals two, it's got a kind of nice picture. So here you uh, make a starter graph, so called. So we had six pools, you put one guy in the middle, one guy at the top, and then you put the other guys as pairs going down the side, okay? And then what you do is you rotate. So notice I've taken this outer ring and rotated it, leaving everything else the same, okay? So, I, or maybe a better way to say it more precisely, I've taken the labels, uh, I've taken the labels and rotated them. Uh, keeping the edges where they are, or you can think about moving the edges. It's, it's sort of dual, I guess. But if I keep doing that, then I get these five graphs, okay? Um, and so if I add labels now, so let's label zero as A, infinity B, and so on, then we get exactly um, these five hypergraph one factors. So this is a really kind of cool construction and it's, um, and you can see it can be done very efficiently, right? You can imagine this is maybe, you know, sort of some small number of lines of um, maybe Python or uh, R, your language of choice. And so, um, um, yeah, so, so this is the construction for Q equals two. Um, yeah, and a fun thing actually is there's a cool connection. This also comes up in tournament design, it turns out and things like that. So that was actually how we sort of discovered this connection. One of our collaborators said, oh, this reminds me of tennis matches, um, so. Cool, so this is hypergraph factorization. David, can you say something a little bit more about like why the heck, what's with that starter? Why is there infinities and, and minus one and plus one and minus, where does that come from? Okay, good question. Um, let's see. Yeah, I don't know if I can say something quick. Um, Okay, in terms of why are we writing zeros, ones, and negative ones, I can give some idea quickly about that. So this is coming from a, uh, you can interpret these numbers as being a, um, uh -huh. you can interpret as having a set zero, one, negative one, two, negative 
negative two, uh, where you're gonna do arithmetic modulo five, uh, five. So modulo five, these things are zero, one, two, three, four, uh, zero, one, two, three, four. So four is negative one, three is negative two, modulo five. Okay, and so, um, right. Okay, so then you've got this, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna append to that uh, this element infinity. Okay, and then the sort of the nice thing, sort of the handy thing about this notation is that rotation here can be represented as taking all these guys and adding one. So if you add one, what do we get? One, two, three, four, and zero. So that rotates all the outer uh, elements and we keep infinity fixed. So that's kind of why we're writing those numbers there. Um, I guess in terms of the picture, we don't need them, uh, but yeah. Uh, yeah, so maybe I'll leave it at, at that. But uh, but suffice to say, there's actually quite a deep theory in combinatorics about uh, a lot of this. Um, yeah, so so uh, yes. Okay, other questions? Are you gonna are you gonna uh, give any hints as to the more general construction that's used in the paper? Ooh, uh, good question. I don't have any slides on it. Uh, if we have time in the discussion, I can maybe pull up our paper and show you. Um, it's a little more complicated. It's got some some. It's Okay, at a fundamental level, it's got some similar similarity, actually, but um, but at the surface, it doesn't look like it at, at first. Uh, okay, well, I'll stay for the discussion. I was hoping to learn a bit about that. That sounded cool. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, this is Luke. I have a quick question. So, how does this construction changes if you have eight? Uh, eight. Oh, good question. Okay, so here, if I have eight, <clears throat> so now I have zero, negative one, one, negative two, two, and then. Oops, I switched my negatives and positives. Oh, I don't know how to erase right now in PowerPoint. So negative two, two, negative three, and three, and infinity. So that's that's the figure I would have. But, and then but, the graph what, would be like this. Yes, yeah, I see. Okay. Yeah. Thank Great you. question. Great question. And you can see you can, you know, you could keep going, right? So and and the fact that m should, oh, by the way, the condition here was again m should be a multiple of q. And q is two, so it basically just means m should be even. As you can see, you can sort of always do this. Uh, you can always do this sort of construction. Okay, so now <clears throat> this is uh, all about how do we try try to figure out how to pool people, right, and form the pools. But uh, one thing we haven't talked about is well, how to decode the results. So you know, now I've got this maybe nice way of pooling people in a way that's balanced, and so I'm going to pool them like this. Here, I'm just reading off the designs. Individual one is going to be in pool A and B. So this is just showing where everyone goes. But okay, now I'm gonna do pool testing. And let's say pool A came out negative, you know, B, C, and D came out positive, E and F came out negative. How am I gonna figure out who to test in stage two? Well, first I can, I'm just gonna eliminate everyone who was in a negative pool. So here are all the negative pools, run them across, go down. And so now individuals one, three, five, and so on, all these people I'm gonna say are negative. And then everyone left over, I'm gonna call a putative positive. So these are the people to be individually tested. And so you can see this decoding process, uh, it's called decoding. This process is simple, right? You can do this with pencil and paper, um, uh, maybe even in your head if you're very good at imagining those things, I guess. Um, and and I, I'd like to note uh, that, um, well, so for, first maybe I'll comment that, you know, this was sort of intentional in that we kind of wanted a method that also is sort of easy to work with in terms of decoding, uh, so that it's sort of easier to implement also in the lab. You know, you don't have to be able to run certain kinds of codes, things like that. Um, now, another point is that you could you could incorporate error correction here in term uh, by sort of saying, you know, if you're worried that maybe you get false negatives, um, that you want to yeah, and you don't want to eliminate those people, you might say, well, I'll allow putative positives to have one to be in one negative pool, for example. Okay, but we're going to focus on uh, not doing error correction here. So if we put it all hey, together, David, yep. Just a question from the chat. Um, does a solution not exist if Q doesn't divide M or is it just not guaranteed for the factorization? Oh, I see. Um, let me think for a moment. Yeah, I think it should not exist because if you sort of count the number of um, how do I say it real quickly? Um, yeah, if you think about forming these one factors, oops, okay, right. So you know, I, I need to, I want to use up all the vertices, right, and exactly once. So that's going to require that the number of vertices is uh, twice the number of edges in the in, in this thing. Does that kind of, does that kind of make sense? Um, oh wait, no, did I get that backwards? Yeah. 
no, I think I got that. Yeah, I got that right. Yeah, yeah, yes. Q is two. It's going to require that um, that I have basically an even number of vertices, which is M. Yes. Okay. I said it backwards, but yeah, there we go. Great question. Now, I guess one could imagine relaxing and thinking this. So hypergraph factorization is actually a more general topic. And so here we're looking at so-called the complete graph. And so if you're not in the complete graph setting, I think this is quite different. So, all right, uh, great question. So putting it together um, now, okay, I see that it's 1144. So uh, am I allowed to go to 1145 or, or, or to 50? What's yeah, you can the, go to 50 uh, or 55. Okay. Yeah, you're good. Okay. We usually great. do 55. Yeah, 55 oh. is fine. Okay, great. So uh, just putting it all together, um, um, we've got, um, yep, we've got this uh, sort of setup stage, which is the hypergraph factorization that we uh, looked at already. And then you're gonna have two stages. The first stage is the sort of pools testing with decoding that we just looked at. And then here, individuals two, four, and seven are the putative positives and we test them in stage two. Okay, so this is the, this is the hyper method that we've uh, pr uh, proposed um, sort of in one slide. Okay, so uh, now we thought a bit about, you know, what are some of the features and limitations and, and things like this, and particular maybe also about what, what are some reasons, uh, what are some features of hyper maybe compared to existing, uh, some of the existing prominent proposals uh, out there. Um, and so uh, uh, here, uh, array designs are a design where you arrange your samples in a grid, um, and then your pools are formed by taking rows and columns. So those are your, that's how you pool. Um, PVEST here actually is a uh, quite sophisticated design using what are called Reed Solomon codes, uh, which have a lot of nice properties. And so they're using that to construct their pools, but they, in fact, they are a one stage method. And so rather than uh, doing a uh, second set of validation tests uh, of individual testing based on who are putative positives, actually they, uh, the design is, is made so that uh, actually from the first, from just one stage, they can already identify individuals. Now, um, one aspect is that uh, it does use, uh, it does split samples six times. And sort of that six way split uh, is, is um, helpful in, in trying to be able to pinpoint uh, individuals. And then there's uh, finally this method called um, hypercube, which uh, forms, it's sort of a generalization of array designs uh, where you sort of make, instead of a, a, a matrix, you make sort of this, or, or instead of making a grid, you make a square, sorry, you make this cube. Um, and then you do like slices of the cube, if I, yep, if I recall. And so, um, uh, yeah, and so kind of a, you know, here this table is sort of highlighting that indeed, you know, kind of uh, the design that we're proposing here, you know, has balanced pools, whereas the random design, you know, is uh, not balanced uh, quite frequently. Um, um, furthermore, we've tried to make it simple to implement by hand and, and flexible or easily adapted. You know, for example, PVEST here uh, was, uh, I think it's being used if I recall correctly, uh, and, and they're uh, using it, for example, in labs that have robotic pipetting. Right, so it's a good fit for that uh, to really exploit the capabilities there, right? But if you don't have that capability, uh, it might be a little tougher to, to use that. Uh, and so, um, yes, so, so we've talked about a number of these uh, already. So, so this kind of is an overview of some of the features of Hyper. Um, one question we asked is, you know, we would like to know how well does it work in particular uh, motivated by um, the kind of uh, modeling and simulations that uh, simulated populations that James was talking about in the first half. Uh, we want to also assess in that simulation setting, uh, how well uh, do these methods work? So here, what we've done is we've chosen a particular hyper design. This is M equals 16. So 16 pools split two ways. And we're comparing against the eight by 12 array. And so both of these uh, use 96 individuals. And what I'm plotting here is the uh, number of individuals screened divided by uh, the number of tests used, okay? And you can see here that um, I think this relates to, you know, something that James showed earlier, you know, early in the ep epidemic when the prevalence is still relatively small, uh, we have <clears throat> quite a boost in terms of efficiency over individual testing. So with the same number of tests we cover, you know, per test we cover, you know, say about, um, oh, I wrote over, I think it's six, uh, around six uh, individuals. But now as the prevalence increases, we have to do more stage two tests and so our efficiency goes down. We have to do more validation tests. Now, if you look at the sensitivity here, um, you can see that uh, the sensitivity here is lower than individual testing. This is because 
you lose some people in stage one uh, due to dilution and just the fact that you're doing another stage, right? So for someone to be identified as positive, they have to sort of make it through the first stage and then also make it through the second stage. And so there's some price you pay in sensitivity, but if your, you know, if your improvement in efficiency is really great, then it might actually pay off in terms of overall identification of people, uh, of infected people. And now on the right, we're looking at designs that use 384 individuals and uh, comparing hyper, uh, another, a different hyper design with the, um, the corresponding array design. There's, a, there's two array designs, a smaller and a larger. And here PBEST appears. And now because PBEST is a one stage design that only does pool testing and no uh, validation tests, well, the efficiency is always eight because it always does uh, covers eight times as many individuals as tests run. Okay, however, uh, kind of where, uh, um, where the prevalence plays in is more to do with the sensitivity. Uh, and so uh, PBEST, at least the PBEST design we're using here is uh, optimized for a prevalence of around 1%. And so you can see after the operating point, uh, the sensitivity does go down, um, at least in this simulation setting. Um, so, um, right. So one thing to note here is that the sensitivity loss we're concerned with in this simulation setting is largely sensitivity loss due to uh, dilution rather than, for example, um, uh, false negative PCR tests. And, and so those uh, those kinds of errors are actually, uh, PBEST has some so-called error correction. And so um, so I think at least our current belief is that uh, that, that that feature of PBEST is not, um, is not maybe highlighted as much in these simulations because uh, we're not sort of incorporating the kinds of errors that it's resilient against. Um, great. So using these kind of simulations now though, we can ask um, <clears throat> similar to James was doing earlier about, well, what's the sort of, we call it here the effective screen capacity and how does it compare for sort of windows of time. And so here the effective screen capacity is, we call it the effective number of individuals screened. So that's how many people did you screen that day, but multiplied by your sensitivity. And the reason we're doing this is again, that uh, well, you could screen a bunch of people, but if your sensitivity is really low, it's really not that useful. So really what you care about is the product of these two. Uh, and so here in these different graphs, we're looking at different budget constraints. So here, this is saying, let's say I can collect 3000-ish samples per day, but I can only run 12 tasks. Well, then individual testing, I have an effective number of tests of 10. Okay, now it's lower than 12. You know, I can screen 12 people, but I have some sensitivity law. Uh, due to sensitivity, my effective number is a little lower at 10. But uh, with hyper, I can actually get an effective number of 122. So in these sort of really testing constrained settings, uh, you can really exploit uh, a lot of the, um, uh, or at least, sorry, uh, when these testing constrained settings, uh, hyper is sort of able to gain some efficiency by exploiting the low prevalence. And um, uh, yes. Uh, so let's see, so sort of a similar thing here on the right, as we increase the number of tests, and now array tests can actually be run. So actually at 12 tests, uh, we couldn't run the eight by 12 array because there was not even enough tests for the uh, first round, for the first stage. Uh, and kind of as we continue, we see as you know, sort of as you get to settings, say for example, 768 tests, um, they sort of perform a little more comparably. And in particular here, these are two settings that are sort of chosen sort of 384, 48, this is exactly the number of samples and tests used by PBEST. And so this is sort of a setting well tailored for it. And you can see generally PBEST, or sorry, Hyper uh, seems to be um, comparable or in some settings uh, um, doing uh, quite, quite well in terms of um, relative, in terms of the uh, number of effective uh, tests or the number of effective individuals screened. David, just um, a heads up about two or three more minutes. Perfect. So. Uh, one thing to note here is that the um, is that here we're also optimizing the choice of the hyper design, so that's shown in white. But uh, where that becomes relevant is basically what we're seeing is that the the number the kind of improvement in efficiency we're seeing here is due to the fact that hyper is uh, easy to adapt, and so we're sort of able to adapt in each of these settings to be tailored for it. Okay. And so now if we sort of expand that comparison, what we end up seeing is sort of across a big grid of sample collection capacities and test capacities that different variants of hyper designs uh, are sort of the best ones among the ones we compared. And so the other ones don't really appear because they're never optimal. So actually maybe I'll uh, skip the last part, which is kind of about the theory and uh, conclude there. And if there's questions about that, we can, we can do that in the discussion. So let me skip ahead. 
Hello. <laughs> and thank you very much for your time. Maybe just say we have, I think it's okay to spend one minute. Can you just say like, <laughs> the, without, you don't have to describe the results or how we got them because I agree yeah. we don't have time, but like, what did we do on the theory? Yeah, so I can say we can look at, there's a common theoretical model, which is look at individuals, just consider individuals as being positive independently with some probability. And, um, and a first version of that is without any, without any test errors. And so kind of the question you can ask, for example, is, well, what's the overall efficiency under this model? And so we've done this kind of calculation and, and we've even done it when tests are noisy and that can be more complicated. So I'll direct people to the paper for that. And then here, I, I want to give some idea of how it's obtained, but uh, maybe I'll just point out that eventually it boils down to bounding the probability that um, for any individual, um, that no, no one else in the pools they were in are positive. So that basically I'm an individual in a pool, what's the probability that among the people, uh, among my sort of co my pool cohort, that none of them are positive, that eventually comes down to bounding this. And for that, we use things like Bonferroni inequalities, or there's a sharper version of that called the Dawson-Sankoff uh, inequality. And then we kind of exploit actually the balance uh, to bound uh, to, to sort of exploit uh, is exploited there. Oh, that makes and then sense. another, oh, yeah. Uh, and then another question is sort of, you know, what's the uh, optimal number of pools? Uh, you know, that if you can characterize you know, how, what's your efficiency, what's the best efficiency you can get. And here actually we use some interesting tools, uh, something called a Puiseux expansion, which, um, uh, which actually makes, allows us to sort of look at the uh, solution of maybe a complicated equation in the limit. And we're able to see here that the optimal number of pools per individual is something like this twice prevalence to two thirds minus prevalence. And this gives a corresponding efficiency of three times prevalence to two thirds, which is better at low prevalence than the Dorfman, corresponding Dorfman efficiency of uh, twice square root P. So these are just plots sort of showing that actually the uh, asymptotic theory does sort of match, uh, you know, kind of uh, non-asymptotic uh, optimization sort of done by brute force. So, okay, with that, I will then thank you again. Thank you for indulging the, uh, yeah, yeah, the, the, those of us who love that kind of stuff. That, that was really yeah. interesting. Thank you. Absolutely.